All right, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. Uh, again, thank the Friends of the Library and the um, uh, libraries in the area for helping us promote today's program. Uh, so let me introduce Marty. Uh, Marty Constant, uh, can you can you adapt to the accelerated pace of change to stay relevant in your work? Our speaker, Marty Constant, researches how people respond and adapt to change in the workplace. As a workplace futurist and career strategist, she has uncovered the one trait that helps you and your organization flourish in today's fast changing environment. And that trait is agility. Uh, Marty is a keynote speaker, trainer, and best-selling author on the topic of career agility, and her core belief is flex rather than fade. As a runner and mountain hiker across several continents, movement and mobility are central themes, yet there is one habit she continues to cultivate, the pursuit of 100 rejections every year to achieve her goals. So please join me in welcoming Marty Constant. Let's give her a big virtual round of applause. Thanks so much, Marty. Thank you for the great intro. Um, I'm so um, excited to be here with all of you. I presented here last December. We just had a phenomenal group. Great experience. So we're going to get right into it. One of the things that I noticed in preparing for any age equity presentation or ageism presentation is, did you know that there's the over 40 group, the over 40 makes up 40% of our workforce today? Kind of interesting. Second thing is you might not know that most DEI trainers are inexperienced. DEI has come into its own that is diversity, equity, inclusion. And age is the last ism that is not really covered in this whole inclusion practice on the part of organizations. So I'm sure a lot of you um, are aware of that. And in surveys, they say that about two thirds of people over 50 have experienced age discrimination at some point. So that's sort of the backdrop um, to what we're talking about today. And I, I'm, I'm a board member of Age Equity Alliance. This is an organization that works with the organizations to help better educate them on this topic and to advocate for you because a lot of us are gonna be working past the conventional um, retirement age. In fact, the ones that are entering the workforce today are likely going to be on average working till between 70 and 80. So this is, this is happening because the 100 year life is happening. So this is why it's so important that those who want to work can work. So that's what we'll be talking about today, how to outsmart ageism. We can't necessarily take care of all of the recruiters, all of the people hiring managers, we're not gonna be able to train them all at once. This is a gradual process. But what we can do is control how we interact with today. So that's what we're going to be working on today. So we'll be sharing the screen here. It is not working, is it? I'm going to stop that again and share it. There we go. All right, play on the start. All right, so Robert, um, let me know, is this the right view? That's the right view, looking good. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we're talking about outsmarting ageism, what you can do. So this is what's happening. The, the goal really is to extend the qualified zone. We all have experienced, unfortunately, that there's a Goldilocks hiring zone. Some call it the sweet spot if you're working in this recruiting and hiring. And there's age discrimination at both ends of the spectrum. 
And the idea here is to do what we can to extend that qualified zone so that we're not designated as overqualified, that we are designated as absolutely qualified. So the agenda today is, why do hiring managers behave this way? And then the next thing, what you can do, what are the five strategies? And we're going to elicit some support from the group on some of the scenarios um, that you may be involved in so that we can all learn. It starts at 40. Age discrimination starts at 40, which some of us that are over 50 say, oh my gosh, I just didn't even realize that. Some even say it starts a little bit younger than that. I put this slide up here because of the internship, really great movie, Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. You can see them staring into this computer. They're totally inept and it's funny but it's not funny in real life. And in the movie, they did get the internship and they were 10 to 15 to 20 years older than most of the people that were in the internship at Google. So what are these people thinking? What are the hiring managers thinking? I ask you, any of you, to think about your 30 year old self. When you were 30 years old, and if you were responsible for hiring someone, maybe you were a little bit intimidated by some of these things. And so maybe it's not that people are unenlightened. Maybe it's that they're uncomfortable, possibly. They're worried about cost. They're making an assumption there that you are going to cost more. Some people may, may be willing to change a lane and cost isn't as big of an issue, but that needs to be communicated if that is the case. They're intimidated. They can often be intimidated by the experience. They feel that you're overqualified and that you might leave after a year. I was talking to a colleague of mine who works at a major global bank in the banking industry. And this woman was hiring for a role Yet this big bank did not have a level at her level. It was just one notch down. Very talented woman. And, she's, and she just made it very clear. I'm going to come. It's no problem. This is what I want to do. I want to work for this organization. And within six months, there was a lot of unhappiness that she was exhibiting towards her colleagues. So this is what people are afraid of. And that person didn't stay at the bank, she took her time and then got another role. That is the nightmare for HR managers. And then it's your tech skills. We talked about the internship with the characters, Billy and Nick, um, they, you know, they need their tech skills needed to be brought up to speed. They were really good at emotional social skills, but not so great at tech skills. And then oftentimes we're perceived as being inflexible. The recruiter, it's a risk assessment. I pulled this off of LinkedIn. I ran a couple of polls. These are coming from recruiters. It costs money to find, hire, and onboard an employee. By the time you hit your one year, you're looking for the next thing that will challenge you. And you're hearing you're overqualified. That's someone telling you to aim higher. So I'm just telling you that this is the other side of the equation. It's not people being mean, it's people being worried about their jobs. The hiring manager, is thinking, we know you're really smart. We know you can do better. You'll leave when you find something better, just like that example I showed. And then there's another assumption. And if this isn't an anchored assumption, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, you may want the maximum amount of money. They have not tagged that role for that price. And then the assumption, you know, they, they may assume that you, you don't want to do something new and challenging, but you really do want to do something new and challenging. That another one, I can see the genuine drive and passion for the pivot. This is a recruiter talking about a poll that I, I, I held, but there's always other candidates that are in that sweet spot. They're in the career path that I'm hiring for, certain level of experience, into the role that we can build from. In other words, they take away my headache simply. This is what they're thinking. So that answers the first question. However, I want to challenge all hiring managers, recruiters, and even challenge ourselves is 
the experience and the ideas you have in your brain cannot be found on Google. It's not searchable. It's unique to the way that you process ideas and the way that you bring your experience to bear for problems and challenges in the workplace. So there's five actions we're gonna talk about today. The first one is narrow cast your experiences. What I mean by narrow cast, I often talk about playing copy editor to your own talking in an interview. Tell people exactly what they need to know, not everything that you can do. If their concern is churn in their sales process, in their call center, then let's talk about churn and not talk about the marketing programs that you ran on the side and the other programs that you were also excellent at. The other thing is, we've all heard it from the excellent resume people, some of who have spoken at this organization, at the, at the library is 10 to 15 years is good enough for the resume. You can accomplish and include the rest of your experience in other, other capabilities. So narrow casting your experiences, pet the elephant in the room, we're older. We're older than the person sitting in front of us. So let's, let's talk about that. Pet the elephant in the room, use ageless vocabulary, update your online persona and communicate in a contemporary fashion and nurture your network. So narrow casting your experiences. I put an acronym together here about putting your best face forward. Focus your experience stories on issues relevant to them. What is it? that they want to know. Your role in texting or messaging or in person is to find out or prep is to find out what that role really means beyond the description. Ask about their problems. Create three to five stories that communicate your attitude and your accomplishments. And then eliminate all unnecessary clutter. There's a thing I do, there's an exercise I do in branding and it's when you throw a lot at the wall of branding, say in the workplace, say you're already there and you say, I can do these 25 things really well. Not credible. You're not known for something. You're kind of, are you the utility player? People don't know how to work with you. So when you eliminate the clutter in this process, particularly in the later stages of your career, it's gonna be more soothing to the person that's interviewing you. When you have things like, why should we hire you? Start strong. You can stick the landing by saying, rather than saying I'm a problem solver, which everyone says, say I'm a fixer. I solve problems in high stress situations that other people walk away from. You know what you're doing there? You're giving them the idea of what it's like to work with you. Nonstick is I am results oriented. I have broad experience. I can basically do it all. Not believable. And always think about this. It's not always the most qualified candidate who gets hired, which is usually you, right? It's the one who is remembered. I have this saying, avoid Teflon. Everything slides off of Teflon when you're cooking it. It's great for cooking, but it's not so great for this. But make, make your words count and make your words efficient. We don't want to tell them everything. We want to edit our responses. Specifics stick. Why should we hire you? Not because you're a people person. I hope you're a people person. Not because you're a team player. I hope you're a team player. If you can say, I hope you're a team player. I hope, I hope so afterwards. You'll know that it's a plain uh, phrase that isn't going to be remembered or I consistently deliver results and blah, blah, blah. Think about a couple phrases, just like we talk about not walking away from tough problems. If you're working 
in the healthcare environment, you're working with physicians and you're automating the office. I care for the back office stuff so you can focus on caring for patients. That is what a hiring manager would want to hear. And it wouldn't be a bad thing to put on your LinkedIn banner if that's what you did. I design marketing programs that capture the attention of customers ready to buy. You know, I bring the giddy up. This is unique. It's special. It's, you know, it's a little inside joke with, um, you know, Kramer who said this, um, you know, on a you know, very, very old TV program, right? Um, but it's just kind of funny. You have to, you know, be aware of who you're saying this to, but it's not just that I design marketing programs. I, I do it when customers are ready to buy. So you're going to solve the problem for them. People rely on me whenever the stakes are high and a decision must be made. So this is what I am going to stop here. And this is where people tell me if you're willing and brave enough to participate. And this is gonna be a really easy template here. I'm asking for one volunteer to think about a scenario in the workplace that you're super proud of. What did you do? What was your contribution? And what was the story? And it can be two sentences. And I promise you, it will be really fun. Everyone will learn and you will learn something about how you talk about your skills. Is there anybody that is willing to step up and learn and get the benefit of one-on-one -on -one coaching here on defining a work scenario that you're proud of? Anybody? So Marty, do you want them to unmute? Uh, how, how do you want them to indicate? Yes, on this, on this particular one, I'd, I'd want them to unmute. So I guess whoever's the first to unmute uh, can uh, can uh, participate. So is there anyone who, uh, I'm looking at the participants, everyone's muted. If uh, first person to unmute gets to, oh, Shannon, I see you unmuted. Would you like to give this a shot? Sure. Great. Thank you, Shannon, you get a gold star. Oh, thank you, Marty. Okay, so I, was doing an audit of marketing presentations because I managed the presentation team. And I realized that every presentation was different because the sales team was going in and creating their own slides as opposed to using the standard pitch book. So I decided to do a round table with the salespeople and ask them why we were changing kind of the approved slide deck because that wasn't what compliance wanted us to do. Um, much to the dismay of the sales team, they realized that everyone was seriously creating their own slides and putting them in uh, approved sales decks or unapproved sales decks. So what we ended up doing was we construct or I constructed a sales training program that every single member of the sales team went through, all of the executives, and it took us probably six weeks. And we realized that our pitch, kind of our 30 second and then our kind of 45 minute pitch, um, had many inaccuracies just due to style and kind of people not sure how to tell the story. And so we're, we were able to rebrand the entire sales pitch process. And um, it was, I thought, a success. People got videotaped, they got audio taped. And um, I would describe that as a successful project, unexpected project that we did in the period of six weeks and then uh, the final outcome was another six weeks later. Okay, so Shannon just described to us this really great scenario. We don't have a lot of time to go on like, oh, well, what were the results? Did it increase sales, that kind of thing. But what we did find out is Shannon has a, a super skill, a superpower. And that is, um, I am the person in the room that asks the extra question to get at the root of the problem. When there's a problem, I'm gonna make certain that we are solving the right problem. And so she could go on and tell this story about how you know, she saved the company face, money, et cetera. We all know sales people, I've worked in sales, we promise things at times that aren't possible. And 
bad sales decks do that for us. So thank you, Shannon. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, so I hope that people learned from this. Say a yay or nay in the, in the chat for me, if you will. And I could just notice if it's getting through to you. Um, a, a Y or an N in the chat. Awesome. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So um, that is how we start to go through uh, your work experience and to be able to take tangibly, tangible work experience and not overwhelm. Notice you're making it relevant. Shannon would have been talking and finding, she would have found out that these kinds of consistency is, uh, oh, I just realized elephant needs a, a, an H right there. So pet the elephant in the room. I talk about this almost as a PR phrase. When you're asked something uh, in the media and you don't know the answer and you're in front of all these cameras, the worst thing you can say is no. You pretty much say things like, I'm not certain about that. However, in my experience, or you say things like yes, and like they do in improv. Yes, that's true. And this other is true. You can use these phrases all the time. I may not be your typical candidate. Hit it head on. However, my skill set and attitude aligns with what your organization is trying to accomplish this quarter based on our discussion. Um, I'm going to make your life, you know, highlight the things that's going to make their life easier. You're going to solve a problem for them that they, uh, aren't realizing you're gonna be able to bring up in the discussion. Uh, you're gonna bring up, I may not be your typical candidate, but I am really interested in learning as well as becoming a part of mentorship programs, mentorship and reverse mentorship. I've worked with teams in this way and you know, the sign of a good team is people who have each other's back. Um, and then anything you can do to exhibit your tech skills competence. So you pet that elephant in the room. There's lots that we could spend like the whole time on this. We don't have time. It could be a career gap, right? I spent two years caring for my father. This isn't me, it's somebody else saying this. Um, and I got this from a real person on LinkedIn, sharpening empathy and compassion skills. I researched and managed a network of essential resources for the best quality of care. I cherish the time spent and have no regrets for making this life-changing decision. My work industry in my work history in this industry dedication and communication skills are highly relevant for this role. No other color to the story, that's it. Maybe you're making a change. In past roles, I worked in management. Maybe you wanna like lessen their concern about the cost, how much you're gonna cost them. In past roles, I worked in management, leading teams. It's my desire to use these skills and awareness to serve the needs of the team and the manager of this team as an individual contributor. Put it right out there. I have talked to more executives that become individual contributors in the last third of their career and they are loving it. Why not put it out there? My interest, energy, and focus, and you're kind of talking about energy. They're always worried about energy, thinking that you know we're not gonna be able to rise to meet those needs. We'll help you achieve department goals. Maybe a salary thing. Maybe you want to hit that in. You know, what is your salary? What's most important to me are the ways that I'll be able to contribute to this. I'd love to hear more about your perspective. Answer a question with kind of another question. Um, it would be helpful to have more information. I would like to defer this conversation until after speaking to the hiring manager. Um, I wanted to see the value you put on this specific role. We could do an entire session on salary questions. Um, if you go to uh, my LinkedIn newsletter, I've got about 30,000 subscribers on LinkedIn. I have all kinds of stuff like this. I have, you know, best salary questions. And, and there's people like Hannah Morgan that has spoken here. There's people like Lisa Rangel that have done a marvelous job in this area. And I've given some resources at the beginning of this session with links to um, downloads that you can get from them as well. Um, so maybe it's your experience. Although I've been quite successful in previous positions, I don't believe you should write, rely only on past success. You're 
a little bit of humility. I'm curious to learn new and better ways to do things. Before suggesting any innovations, I would first make certain I understand the company policies on this. I made this mistake mid-career. Somebody hired me in to be a change agent. And um, I did, <laughs> I went in there and it was like a bull in a china shop, right? No one really wanted to work with me for that time until I figured this out. The innovation is great, but you have to socialize it along the way. So um, anyone else, similar to Shannon, um, anyone else wanna take a crack at, tell me about yourself or why should we hire you? And it's okay if we don't get someone for this because we had a great conversation with Shannon, but is there anyone else that would like to participate here and get some guidance? It's part of your elevator pitch, which a lot of people have. So if anyone's interested, they can unmute. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll move on. Okay. We could always ask this at the end too. Um, the next thing is use ageless vocabulary and contemporary vocabulary in your resume on your LinkedIn profile. And don't make the mistake, you know, I'm a professional speaker and I can't tell you how many times I've seen people on the stage uh, say something odd and they'll go, oh, you know what? I think I'm having a senior moment. Don't do that to yourself. That takes you down a notch as if there's a competency that's being attacked there. It might be funny and it might be self-deprecating, but it brings people back to a concern that you don't want them going there. Saying things like in my day, um, I hear this probably once or twice a month. Someone's on the stage, someone's you know, in an interview. Well, you know, I'm dating myself when I say this. They'll, they'll say the name of a group that they listened to in high school or, and, and it has nothing to do, nothing to do with the job description at all. And here they go talking about dating themselves. And that's, that's what a hiring manager doesn't really wanna see or hear. They just wanna hear that you're contemporary, you can solve the problems, you, you can do everything that's possible. Um, they never wanna hear things. People don't like the word pay your dues. That's a really bad, phrase. It's a phrase that I grew up with, but it's not a phrase that's contemporary at all. Uh, get rid of Rolodex. The, these kinds of things came up in the internship as well. Rolodex, it's your contact list. It's not a tape, it's record. You don't ping anybody. Nobody calls anybody anymore. It's text, email, DM. Um, yellow pages, no, you know, Google. Um, it's everything's online. And I go back to the internship, they kept on saying everything was on the line. And we were all laughing at them because it's like they couldn't get it in their heads that you just use the word online. Uh, contemporary email address, use Gmail. It's free, it's there. Um, get rid of Yahoo and Hotmail, you know, Hotmail and AOL. Um, and then get rid of things like Clicker and use remote. So that one's pretty easy. And the, the fourth one here is update your online presence. And this has a lot to do with your online um, image. LinkedIn, we're just going to talk about pretty much. But it also has to do with um, the background you have when you're in a virtual interview the lighting you have so that you don't look like you're talking in the shadow, the, uh, the web, you're, you know, my husband during COVID, um, he didn't have a webcam. So he just put his, uh, we, he put his computer on a stack of books and he had the camera like this. So I encourage you to be looking into the camera, dress for the role, dress like you're, you know, on an interview, like, Today, I, I put a skirt on and, and I'm sitting here. Sometimes I'm standing, but when I'm sitting, both of my feet are on the ground. My shoulders are back. I've got confidence coming through. People pick up on that. And this is something that you can practice. Um, standing is a really good thing. I do that often. And by all means, look into the camera, just like I am doing with you right now. I'm not looking at the sides. I'm looking at the camera. I'm looking just at a a strange black speck, right? 
And, and just make sure that you've got um, your, you know, test out your mic. Robert and I did testing ahead of time so that when I was displaying this screen that it didn't look awkward or messed up or unprofessional in any way. So that, that is a part of your online presence. And so much of this is your confidence. So now this is something that my friend, Catherine Johns, she used to be a radio personality. Um, in the city of Chicago for WLS. And um, she was the uh, kind of the funny sidekick. And um, she said that she gives presentations on communication skills in person and virtual. And she said, energy is often a code word during job search. And it's, it's when they use something in a job description, these days, they're gonna be making a big mistake if they say must be energetic because that, that can be considered ageist job description. So energy is often a code word during job search. So even if it's not in the job description, it is up to us, it's up to you to project the kind of energy that you think is necessary for the job, just like it would have been 10 years ago or 10 years into the future. Um, it's a show, it is associated with you. When you see energetic candidate, which they better not be writing, you know, job descriptions like this, they'll usually not be looking for an in individual in their fifties. Projecting energy is important in interviews. Practice, look into the camera, record yourself. The older you are, the more important this becomes. So we have an online presence here. Um, Colleen Knight, um, I've profiled her a couple of times, but she came to one of my sessions uh, a year and a half ago. And we did one of those live things, just like we did today, you know, that Shannon so bravely stepped up. And she came up with this idea of, I said, well, what is it that you do? We were getting at, we were getting at some branding phrases for her. And she came up with, I write playbooks for organizations that beat their chaos monsters. Um, and she does process improvement, you know, or you know, streamlines, automation, outsourcing, things of that nature, all in the realm of project man management. Um, so this is something that made a big difference for her um, as she was in the middle of job search. This is, um, I just went into her profile yesterday or the day before, and this is how she has updated it. You'll notice that she updated her photograph. And she's just looking like right into the camera and you know, just a really great smile. You know, some of us smile, some of us don't. Um, it, and she's got a really nice pink uh, blazer there that just stands out. It looks very vibrant. So this is what I mean when I say online presence. And you notice how she's evolved here. Um, COO for nonprofits and social good organizations, operational development. Um, and she also did something really smart. She took the chaos tamer. Uh, I'll go back because I'll show you what it looked like before. She used to have Colleen Knight Consulting. Some of us do consulting in between jobs. And you'll notice that if you don't have a page dedicated to your online consulting business, it looks like this little gray thing, really unimpressive and doesn't look very official. What she did is, um, we, we can't scroll down to it right now, but she took Chaos Tamer as her consulting business. She created a logo and she has it sitting there um, you know, right now. And she's working for a, um, a consulting group right now. But the, the Chaos Tamer actually has its own logo and you're able to not have these sad little gray logos um, in there that don't look that official. Um, this is a, a, a person I worked with a little while ago. Um, he was in the Navy and he was retiring from the Navy. And, you know, in the military, you can retire in your 40s. So you're still pretty young. And um, he needed to upscale. He was used to working for the military, but not for um, enterprises. And I encourage everyone, take a page out of Andrew's book. Look at what he did. He's, in, he's an expert in cybersecurity. 
one of the best. Um, and he was able to navigate through a few different job offers. He's, he just uh, started working at Dell Technologies recently. And, um, but this is, this is an attitude that comes out from Andrew, right? Never stop learning, innovating, leading. So whether, you know, you might really like that picture, um, I don't know, of trees or the beach or books or whatever, but try to think about having it be a conceptual visual to support your strength so that when someone sees you online, it's impressive. Um, this is another one. Uh, she specialized in DEI. She worked for an organization at the time, and she was consulting. And this is something, remember before I said uh, you could actually put, um, I take care of all the stuff in the back office so you can focus on patients. You could have that as a headline. She put, I train recruiters and hiring leaders in effective diversity recruiting strategies. Very straightforward. It doesn't have to be super clever and created. And then she also coaches on the side. So that's how she does hers. But she has noticed that she's wearing yellow and she has yellow in the header. There's so many things you could do with Canva to get something like this. Um, so we are on our last one and it it's, could go a little while, but I just wanted to find out if anybody has any questions that you would like answered before I get into nurturing your network. And we might do the same thing, Robert, where we um, do the uh, unmuting. Do have so any Marty, we do, we, we, and that's fine. We do have some written questions in the chat. Um, so KD asks, uh, do photos on online profiles perpetuate ageism? And I know you just kind of spoke to that, but do you, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, I would say that um, photos can counteract age discrimination. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll notice Colleen Knight had a really pretty, um, uh, you know, uh, pink blazer on. Um, she had her hair done. She had her hair done differently than she did the first time, right? We just saw a difference in two years time. So there's a lot of things you can do. And this isn't about white hair, gray hair. Um, this isn't about like telling women they all have to color their hair. Some do, some don't. It's totally fine. Men, men do too. Uh, some color, some don't. But yeah, I do think it's the, the vibrancy of your smile will counteract a lot of what your concern may be. So that's how I would answer that question. And I think if you work with a photographer, um, I've worked with a couple different photographers over the years and um, to, you know, to make certain that I'm contemporary, that I'm wearing the right clothes. Um, you know, and it's, it can be, you know, you might be overwhelmed and go, well, that might cost money. Well, if it means, I call it an opportunity cost. If it means that you could be hired six months sooner or a year sooner, what would that be worth to you? So would it be worth, you know, 600 to a thousand dollars? Um, you, you can, and you can get headshots for a lot less than that by a professional photographer. So that's how I would answer that. I used to be an art director. So I'm all about like wearing the right makeup, uh, wearing the right color, um, and just, um, you know, having someone that's not you, maybe a person that actually does hairstyling, um, consult with them and go, what do you think would look good for a professional photo for me? Mm -hmm. Uh, Edward has a comment. He said a, recru a recruiter told him last spring. Uh, so this is in reference to you saying, you know, not not to put more than 15 years worth of job experience on your resume. Uh, Edward says uh, that the recruiter told him, you don't have to tell them everything. It's OK for job seekers to leave some mystery for the job interview. Um, but then Nancy does have a question. Nancy writes, what if you were at a job for more than 10 years that would result uh, in showing more than 10 to 15 years of experience? Um, but then if you eliminated that uh, long-term job, it would probably show too little experience and be deceptive. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, what I would say, it's always, it depends. This is what engineers always used to tell me when I would ask them a question. You know, I'd want a straight answer and they'd say, it depends. 
Um, when I say the spirit of the recommendation is 10 to 15 years. In your situation, if you've worked at a place for 20 years, that may be an exception. The same thing with resumes. You know, it could be a page longer because of your expertise, but you just have to use the right judgment. Um, I know I had super cool tech experience right out of college. It was my earliest years. That had to fall off there a long time ago and I didn't want to lose it. It was telecommunications infrastructure. And so I found other ways to integrate that throughout my um, persona online. Uh, and then we had a few folks ask about slides and recordings. Uh, so everyone, if you email uh, Marty, she'll send you the slides. That's my understanding. Yes. And then, yep, yep. And then I would, and her email address is in the chat. Uh, I shared it. Uh, she shared it at the beginning, and then I shared it uh, recently, uh, along with the resources that she provided. Uh, but then also, I will email you the recording tomorrow at some point. Okay, so uh, you'll get the recording from me and the slides from her. Uh, okay, so now if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question of Marty, perhaps we can take a couple of questions uh, that way. Uh, Kathy, it looks like you unmuted. Did you want to ask a question? Are you there, Kathy? Or maybe that was a mistake. We, we, we still have room at the end. I, we can go through the, the nurture just so we get through all of this, but I'm really glad that we were able to get a couple of questions answered. And if there's any more questions, just put them in the, um, in the chat as I go through the, the networking. I save the networking to last, not because it's not the most important, it's probably the single most important. 72% um, of um, recruiters are either recruiting through LinkedIn or intend to recruit. So just, just to state that networking, a lot of this is done on LinkedIn. So it's really important to make a commitment to networking. And I, you know, I, I know a lot of coaches in my world, a lot of career coaches, and they all say the same thing. They say, I really want to work with the motivated individual that will actually do the networking do the informational interviews, reach out to people. It takes a lot of guts and bravery to do this, but it will 10X, 10 times amplify your results if you do this. So if you have 50 informational interviews, chances are you're going to have way more real interviews than if you tried to send out your resume to 200 um, job boards, 200 um, job descriptions. Um, that, that gets a one to 2% rate of response. So the networking definition that we're talking about, um, I came across this from Sulaima Gurlani, uh, leadership strategist said, networking is mapping out who you know. And I, I think about this as just put it on your desk and just think about you know, doing it on pieces of paper or on a spreadsheet, map out who you know, nourish the relationships you have, and expand your circle by getting to know the people you don't know. And 80% of your opportunities are going to come from people you do know. Maybe not that, maybe not that they're going to refer you in for a job, but they're going to refer you in for an informational interview that will get into a job interview. So 80% of that is going to happen from the circle, but you're always wanting to get into people. Andrew, who I profiled earlier, um, that came from a person he didn't know, um, the, the Dell job. But other jobs that he had gotten interviews for came from people he did not. Um, I will tell you um, this, a lot of people tell me that their jobs that they're in right now came from the kindness of strangers. That's how they phrase it because it's people that they hardly knew at all. It's a friend of a friend of a friend. And it was just like this really fine thread that they got it. And so the idea here is to build a network before you need it. And very often people want to like, get really intense with building their network fast. And uh, networks don't build fast, but it's never too late to start. Even if you're starting today, start, but don't think that you can build it so fast and get it cultivated so fast that it's going to be reaping rewards immediately. 
So the idea is to build it before you need it. If you don't have a network built, start now. Does anyone have any ideas? And you can put this in the chat. We don't have to open this up for, um, if anyone has interesting things, I'm gonna go through some ideas for, for networking, but care to share any of your networking ideas that you think have worked particularly well or networking concerns even. So I will leave that up there. Um, I wanna, um, oh, I wanna answer Tom's question before we go on. Do you recommend omitting the dates of your graduation or degree? Um, I don't put the dates of my graduation on anything. And I, I think most uh, uh, career consultants will say the same. You may get career consultants that say otherwise, but um, they're not necessary. They're not even relevant. Um, and then Anne says, are we able to change the LinkedIn background behind the photo? It's, it's um, to quote somebody that I follow on LinkedIn, um, I'm forgetting her last name, Jihan. Um, it's easy peasy. Just uh, Google, change the background on LinkedIn, and you'll get right to like five articles on it, and you'll be able to do it in five minutes. It's so easy. And if you uh, go on to the free version of Canva, C A N V A dot com, it's a an art setup for creating slides and it has a whole section on LinkedIn banners. <laughs> so um, I've had a lot of people in job search work teams just use some of their setups. So they'll use a new photo, but they'll use the layout um, that they have. Okay. Um, so, so what are the barriers to networking? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fess up too, because I worked in sales for a while too. And um, I liked the relationship building part of sales, but it was, even though I liked it, it was hard because it kind of feels icky. It feels like I'm putting myself in front of them too often. Um, you might say, it's not me, it's not you. Uh, the fear of rejection, ooh, it feels like selling. Um, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what to ask. Um, you might say, well, I'm an introvert. Well, good news for you, introverts work really well one-on-one. -on -one. They have a harder time on the one to many in big networking receptions, but they do really well one on one. So there's there's lots of ways that you, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert or an ambivert, there are ways that you can break through these barriers. Does anybody else have any ideas about uh, any other barriers to networking? You can just put them in the, um, you can put anything you want to in the chat because I am monitoring it now. Um, this is so much of what we go through when we are in job search. It's a hard time. Uh, we're often, you know, we may have gotten let go. It might not have been our choice. It may have been our choice because we had a bad boss. It was a toxic environment. But there's a time period, and I caution every job searcher to give yourself some time to heal um, in a way that you can ditch the desperation demeanor when you're talking to people. People want to talk to, it sounds like really shallow, but people want to talk to upbeat problem solvers, people that are, are gonna come in and help them in their roles. They don't really wanna do anything that's gonna help you. And I, I know that sounds really callous, but that's their job is to find someone that's gonna solve their pesky problem. Um, Vanessa says, a lot of people have social anxiety after the pandemic, and that's a very real thing. Um, the um, and it's okay to honor that. Um, I I'm I'm a big fan of honoring um, what's hurting you. Um, if you're not ready to do that road show. Um, I'm not suggesting you take six months, but you might take a week or two. You might do uh, take longer walks, do what is necessary. We all think, oh my gosh, I've got to make that money and I got to make it now. But some of those people that have that, that you know, anxiety and upset, um, 
they may be out of work for six months to a year. And had they known then, they might have relaxed a little bit into it. Uh, imposter syndrome, Valerie, very good one. So we think that um, you know some of us don't. Um, when I got my first VP job, the guy that was interviewing me that I had worked for before, he like slid me into the VP position. I was afraid to ask for it. And I, I'm ashamed to tell that story even, but I'm sharing it with you because it's very real to say, well, like, you know, maybe someday I'll get there. You're like, well, someday is now. You know, if you're ready to be a manager, if you're ready to be a director, just go for it. The worst that could happen is you'll be at the, the level that, that you're already at. Um, but, but I got to a point where it's like, I just wanted to keep going further and more then because I went to business school. So that's what we do, we manage. So that, that was my path. Um, so remember this, that as you're building your network, it's relational, not transactional. So we've all had the person who, you know, their parent sent me their 25 or 30 year old child and said, you know, they, they just need, they need a job. And then, you know, I meet with them and they pretty much look at me and say, well, are there any jobs open? They, 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 they don't know how to build a relationship. Now I'm talking about a 25 or a 30 year old, which seems kind of young, but we need to learn that we, you know, whether we're 35 or 55 or 65, it's all about the relationship. If you're on LinkedIn at all, we've all been, um, I call it pitch slapping. I didn't invent it, someone else invented that term, but people try to sell you things before they even know you. So just remember this, try to think about when you're reaching out to open up relationships, you open up the relationship first before you ask for other things. You connect with them first on LinkedIn before you ask to meet with them unless it's a hiring manager and you know they're looking and you're connected with them on LinkedIn, then it's okay. But if you're just building out your network of people that you know in one of your target companies, there's a process for that that makes a whole lot of sense. People help people they know, like, and trust. This is a, a sales maxim. Maxim. It's confidence for the win. I keep on saying, you know, let's not be uh, desperation. And I, I, you know, picked up this guy that he he's a, an image from canva um that i picked up and it's like beware of the transactor it's like we're, they all they want they're like gimme 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 i want something from you the minute people see that from you they um instinctively turn the other way it happens a lot on linkedin so some of the the virtual methods you know i, I talked about the kindness of strangers Establish your goals for what you want to accomplish, for how many. And again, you go to job search, um, you know, boot camps and things like that for that. But, you know, make a list, make a target list of your companies, you know, email them. Um, I follow a couple really smart um, salespeople. I'm, I'm forgetting, <laughs> forgetting the, his name right now, but I thought, so because I have to do outreach for my business too, and it gets really scary. And it's important, you know, in today's world, we don't pick up the phone, we email, we direct message, we connect with someone on LinkedIn, maybe a little while later, we um, say, would you be willing to have a conversation with me? I'm looking for roles in the area that you work in and would love to know what the day in the life is like and, and product management, go through that kind of thing. Um, and so what do you say? People, that's like the thing. People go, well, I don't know what to say. What do you say in your digital outreach? And these are my last uh, two slides. They're, they're not, you know, it's not a template that's going to work for everybody. But remember, I said there's like several stages in LinkedIn. The very first stage is connect. Connect. And you, you can get to be more direct and say, you know, I, I'm, you can actually say I'm interviewing for a job at Dell and would really like to better understand the culture. It looks like you work in marketing, you know, I'm actually looking at engineering, but would you, you know, would you be willing to, uh, you know, take 10 to 15 minutes to chat with me so I could better understand the culture at Dell? You know, the, you, it's just logical stuff. Hi, my name is, you know, Marty. As a project manager focused on artificial intelligence projects, 
if you happen to be that person, I'm intrigued by your rate of success in helping organizations adapt to technology change. So you've looked at them online. You notice something about them. This just happens to be a tech example. I'm researching best practices to accomplish this. Are you available for a five minute chat or 10 minute chat or a 15 minute chat of how you've innovated in this area? But again, remember I said specifics stick. Uh, just saying, I wanna to talk to you will send them the other way. It'll be scary for them. They don't, they don't, they're not in it for a long conversation, but if you're very specific about what you want to accomplish, um, this is another one. Um, as a DevOps engineer focused on blockchain projects, I got real geeky here because I do a lot of stuff in tech. I'm researching smart ways to advance in the profession. So you can be honest. I, I, I wanna move forward. Your track record for innovation when there, when there is no playbook is impressive. So use words that complement them, that make it a no brainer for them to click, yeah, I'll connect with this person. Um, and these two particular uh, templates actually are asking for something, but it's asking for something really small. But in many cases, it's as simple as like, an, if you're open to it, uh, to connecting, I'd love to, you know, connect, uh, um, I think you know, we could add some value to each other. Just use your own words. You can use templates that you find online, but in the end, it's gotta be you. So I'm gonna see if there's um, Bob O'Neill. Oh, Bob, I don't know if you want me to uh, say this, but uh, I, I like what you said anyway, so I, I'm gonna share it. I don't think it's, um, uh, it's proprietary, but if you want their time, be candid and ask for it. Bob, bingo, this is great but be prepared to give them a brief summary of the reason for the call. So he just summarized what I exemplified here. Um, our time is as valuable as theirs and letting them know you respect their time, they may well come back with a yes. And Bob, I'm guessing that you're in the career space because, or you've been around this because that's a really smart uh, way, um, a, a, a smart way to approach. Um, so we are at our time, I think, uh, Robert's already giving stuff for next week. <laughs> Marty, um, no, it's fine. If you want to go a few extra minutes, well, that's certainly okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if there's any other questions, I'm here for you. Um, and I'm here to, to say that, you know, it's, it's like where we started. No one else has what's in your mind. Google does not. This is unique to you, and you, know, you can even say something like that in the in the in the interview. But it, you wouldn't say the Google thing. But there are things that you know. Oh, I I, I think it was um, somebody. I think it might have been Hannah Morgan uh, had a suggested in one of her posts of, um, you know, I'm able to learn from my mistakes, or I'm able to mitigate mistakes because of these things. You can actually put in uh, phrases that will put them at ease, that will be telling them that, yeah, I am experienced, but you're not like telling them that you know everything and you're not taking up their time and boring them with everything that you know as well. So- Does anyone wanna unmute and ask a question uh, via audio or if anyone has any final questions for the chat, uh, now is the time. Um, I will, uh, looks like Valerie unmuted. Valerie, would you like to ask a question? Hi, Marty. I appreciate all that you were saying. It's really good advice. I'm getting better at my interviewing, but I did this interview a couple weeks ago in person. And all he kept saying, the hiring manager, was how difficult the job was. It's a difficult job. It's a difficult job. And I just kind of was turned off by that. And I felt like, well, of course, it's a difficult job. Work is difficult sometimes. I, I mean, I don't know. I didn't know what to say to that. I just kind of was like, okay, yeah, oh, I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. And I don't even think that's the right answer to say that. Yeah, so um, one way to respond to, first of all, it might not be a good fit for you. Um, number right. And that you, you, have, you have the joy and the power of making that decision. But I think one way of, ans of answering that or responding to that is, is ask, remember I said specific stick? Uh, ask him, you know, in, if it's ever happened again, um, describe your 
most difficult day or describe a difficult thing that you've seen happen in this role, this recruiter or whatever. Um, give me an example. Um, you know, in, in the more information that they give you, then you can say, yes, that, that can be a challenge. I can share a way that I overcame that challenge and this is what I did. Okay. Great. But, yeah, but but you're right. For someone just to say they're difficult, it could be code for like you know he wants for something else too. But regardless, yes. of, regardless of whether it's code for something else, and maybe you're not going to be a candidate for this, always be testing your ability to be the greatest PR respondent. Those people that are on TV that always have all the answers watch some of them sometimes some of them are irritating and some of them are brilliant and when they respond to those really difficult questions they um they veer around it if they don't have the answer and it's very artful it's very fun to watch tv difficult tv interviews mm. in the press. Um, and I, I watch them all the time. And some people I go, oh, wow, he just did a really bad job on that or a great response. I might not even like the person, but he had a great response to the question. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I'll know for next time. Be, be, be like a PR maven. Yes, and, um, you know, I might not, you know, I might not be the most obvious choice. However, this is what I can bring to the table. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Great. Thanks, Thank Valerie. You. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, so sure. last call for questions. If anyone has any additional questions, now's the time. And uh, as Marty mentioned, uh, I put in the chat information for next week. Uh, we're hosting a local attorney, uh, Joshua Robbins. Uh, we hosted him last year. He was excellent. Uh, he'll be back uh, again to talk about the law as it relates to employment contracts and offer letters. So, um, if you ever wanted to ask a question uh, on employment contract law, uh, come, come next week, bring your questions. Uh, so Marty, I'm gonna poke around the chat here. Ellen recommends to Valerie, watch the White House press secretary. Yeah, I mean, that, these yeah. people are great because they they get the worst questions, right? They, it's just, it's, it's really hard. And I, you could do me, everyone that's left, you could do me a solid. If you could just type in one thing you learned from today's session. Just throw it in the chat. This would help me enormously. Mm -hmm. so, so do that for Marty, folks. And um, so Marty, I'll, I'll email everyone tomorrow a, a link to uh, the recording. And also, I'll include your email address and your resources. And if folks want the uh, slides from today, uh, they're going to want to email Marty directly. So uh, that information will be in the email tomorrow. Uh, but as Marty said, uh, in the chat, uh, let, let her know uh, one piece of uh, advice you're going to take from today's talk or one uh, nugget of wisdom that you uh, you learned. And uh, they're coming so, in now, Marty. I see. Yeah, Marty. they're coming in. So, so you know. Keep my answers short. Pet, pet the, uh, pet the envelope. Pet, pet the um, elephant. Persistence. Answer yes and uh, figure out ways around. I'm a fixer. Um, the importance of a strategic choice for your LinkedIn background image. Improve my LinkedIn description. Practice answering difficult questions. I can solve the problem. Every job is trying to solve a problem. I like to hear if you hear overqualified. Aim higher. Um, network, even if you're an introvert. All right, so I'm, I'm, and then how to effectively ask for networking assistance, in, you know, from my people. So I think we've got it, Robert. I think we've got everything. This is really, eliminate graduation and education dates. Yes, for sure. All right, Marty. Well, thank you so, so much for this wonderful presentation. Greatly appreciated as always. Uh, I want to thank everyone. We had like over 40 people at one point, which is a great turnout for us on a Monday. Uh, I did want to uh, quickly acknowledge um, the libraries in Ashland, Andover, Wakefield, Norwood, Clinton, and Somerville for helping uh, promote uh, today's talk for me. And I want to thank Marty, who also did some promotion, which was greatly appreciated. Marty, do you have any last words? 
Um, just, you know, you all are so special and we are heading into the 100 year life. And if you want to work, it is your right and the world will need to accommodate us. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Marty. Thank you all. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week and uh, I'll see some of you next Monday. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.